Hey, I'm excited today. We're going to do some astrophotography. So follow me. Let's go do this. There's the ultimate astrophotography setup. Let's see what's going on outside. Oh man, it is soaking wet. But no worries. Put another shrimp on the barbie. We're going down under to photograph today. Okay, so let's take a little break here. Let me show you where this remote telescope is. It is in Coonabara Bran, Australia. So let's take a quick journey over to Coonabara Bran. And you can see where it is located in Australia, certainly inland from the coast. The observatory is called Siding Spring Observatory. This is obviously a pretty dark location. Now let's take a look at the observatory, this is called the Eye Telescope website, and that's the group of telescopes that I access. They have multiple locations. There's New Mexico Skies, which I visited personally back in 2013. There's a Sierra Remote Observatory, and of course, Sighting Spring Observatory. And you can see here they have four, eight telescopes on site. And you can look at those telescopes right here. You can see all their locations, and then just click on Sighting Spring Australia. And there's your Sighting Spring Observatory, and you can go right to the telescope options that you have. Now, the one I used to gather this data for Eta Carina was the FSQ-106 Telescope 8. I used that the entire time. And you can see here, we can go down to technical information on that telescope. And it will give you the field of view, a nice visual reference there. You can also import that into your into your planetarium software. The CCD camera, it's an FLI Microline 16803. You can see here all the readouts, all the specifications. Another important thing to pay attention to is they give you the calibration time frames that, that they have for darks and flats and, and bias frames. So you can see here, calibration data is available for 60 second, 120, 180, 300, 600, and the various binnings that they have. Available. So you want to stick your exposures to those calibrated frames because they calibrate it for you. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, so we're talking about using remote telescopes. And if you're like me, I'd really never considered it. I liken it to the analogy of would Ansel Adams have ever set up his large format camera and Wi-Fi in to the photo that it was taking at the base of one of the great Yosemite landscapes. I don't know that that's a fair analogy. I've really, the other side of that is, if you know Ansel Adams, he was all about technology and utilizing the technology that was available to reach and express your vision. There are really two sides to the Ansel Adams analogy, and that's where I am today. Here's what I want you to think about. Think about using remote imaging, at least as part of a tool in your toolbox. Here's some reasons why. Clouds. We have a lot of clouds here in Appalachia, in the eastern U.S. These observatories are at world-class locations. Do they have clouds? Yeah, they have clouds, but they have a lot less often than I do in my backyard. Remote telescopes in both hemispheres. Southern Hemisphere gives you access to some beautiful, world-class objects that you may never get a chance to image in your lifetime. You get to use telescopes, focal lengths, cameras you would never own. These are multi-thousand dollar systems. Did I mention clouds? We have clouds a lot here in the east. If you've never had good high quality data from a dark sky, this is a, an eye-opening experience when you take a luminance frame of 10 minute exposures and see how good the data is with these high quality cameras. Take a narrow band filter image, supplement your own RGB image. The rates are cheaper during moon periods. The fuller the moon, the cheaper the rate. When you consider astronomical imaging to be one where the imager should be under the stars, albeit not the entire night, I'm certainly not out the entire night, most of the time, at a star party I might be. But if they have to be out under the night sky to be legitimate, which I used to think, you know, to really be a legitimate astrophotographer, you need to be out, you need to be cold, you need to see the frost on the scope. You need to hear the animal noises, feel the deer breathing down your neck, have the deer snort at you. 
I still believe that's a big part of astrophotography. We really should consider using remote observatories to capture things we'll never be able to capture in our lifetime to supplement some of our own personal work. So I want you to consider using a remote telescope in your own astronomical imaging goals. Okay, it looks like we are close to going here for our astrophotography session down at Sighting Spring Observatory. So what we're looking at here is the real sky, all sky camera that is live. And as you can see here, look at that Milky Way. Goodness, I hope to see that someday. That's definitely on the bucket list. And we are checking, let's see if we can check our schedule. Okay, so here we are looking at the schedule. And right now, I believe mine is ready to come up. And this is the Eta Carina file with the LRGB. I hope I'm doing this right. <laughs> we are an hour and a half into image capture. It looks like we're getting close to finishing up our luminance capture, which was going to be an hour and a half. Okay, I've downloaded my first luminance file. This is an already calibrated FIT file. They do send it in a zipped format, so I've unzipped it and I've opened it here in PixInsight. And I'm really excited about, about this image. Uh, this is a 10 minute, 600 seconds, 600 second luminance on that Takahashi FSQ 106. And I'm sure I've covered the details somewhere else in this video. But this is the Atta Carina. We have applied a screen transfer function. So this is a standard stretch that's going to happen to the fit file. And if we zoom in to one to one, you can see there's our keyhole nebula. And this is looking really pretty good. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any issues here. Auto guiding looks like we are right on the money. Uh, there's some star elongation here on this end, but this really looks pretty solid at 100%. The image session is complete and everything was executed properly. I see all of the files. Oh, let me go there. So here's our file directory on their remote listserv. My luminance files are listed first, then we did the reds, then the greens, and then the blues. Of course, it has your standard FIT file designation. I did bend the luminances one by one, and then all the colors were bent two by two. So time is money with this remote telescope, and you want to make sure you have your ducks lined up when you go to scheduling this. So first and foremost, get your planetarium software. Make sure you get your field of view for your scope that you've decided to select and make sure you know when your object is going to be up in the sky. I input Melbourne as my location, but you can try to drill down specifically to the coordinates that are provided by the observatory. Melbourne seemed to work fine in most cases here. So you are going to make sure that you are checking. In this case, this is at a Carina that we're monitoring. And you can see here that I had it set for March 20th. I think that was the first image that I really went to gather. Eta Carina crosses the meridian here really pretty close to midnight. So it was a great time to photograph it. You want to get your planetarium lined up for the location and you want to get your field of view accessed for the object that you want to frame. This is the field of view I utilized. It's very close to my 92 millimeter stowaway with the uh, focal reducer. So just to make sure I had the full frame covered for Eta Carina. Before I jump to my 2020 image, let me show you something I did back in 2010. And this is from the Winter Star Party. I did capture this with my own gear. It's so remarkable to be able to capture Eta Carina from the continental United States, but we are able to do it. I made a video on what this looks like in the planetarium software. So take a look at this. This is the scene from Big Pine Key in Florida, home of the Winter Star Party, looking due south. And we're showing Eta Carina in the month of January, late January, as it traverses the sky. And you can see it does not get very high. It gets four to five degrees above the horizon, crosses the meridian around 3 a.m. And you really need excellent sky conditions all the way to the horizon to be able to even see it, 
let alone photograph it. But we did take a photograph 10 years ago, 2010, at the Winter Star Party, the only location from continental U.S. that you can really access at a Carina Nebula. Now that you've seen that, you understand that this object does not get very high above the ocean horizon. But we still went for it. We had a great night. Transparency was great all the way down to the ocean. This was with the Takahashi 85 FSQ and my Canon T1i modified by Brent Maynard. Visions change. It's way oversaturated for what I would like to do today. If I had to reprocess it, I'd pull back the saturation. Uh, but I was really happy just to gather the image. So that was from 2010. Let's look at 2020. So here's 2020. Really happy with how this all came together. Once I got the green channels worked out, I had a little frustration there, but that was this is my first LRGB in years. I haven't done an LRGB since my S big ST10 days. So the LRGB came together very nicely. I love this. The the stars are just absolutely fantastic. The uh, dynamic range was fantastic. I did very little to this image, to be quite honest. Just a little bit of a stretch, a touch of color adjustment, um, and just trying to get the image to where the contrast holds up, but yet I bring out the completeness of the nebula. So without, of course, burning out the bright core. So I love this image and I love this object. So uh, while we're talking about it, let's look a little bit more at what Eta Carina is. Eta Carina is just an amazing nebula. It's about four times bigger than Orion, and it's a first magnitude. It's a stunning object. It's large. It's two stars at least in the process of dying. Look at this Hubble image. I encourage you to get to the Southern Hemisphere or get to the Winter Star Party to really see this nebula in person with your eyes. It is fantastic. Again, thanks for joining me for uh, this video on internet telescopes, and it was a blast. I had a great experience with this. I highly encourage you to check it out. You're going to get to use some gear that you would never get to use. You're going to get to image some objects that really literally are not accessible, or you're going to be able to image objects at focal lengths you just don't have or you're gonna be able to image objects when sky conditions don't allow. If there's a comet in the sky and you're clouded out, you can maybe grab some time on an internet telescope. So it was a blast. I'm really happy with the image. I'm really happy with the quality of the data. And iTelescope has been pretty user-friendly and great to work with. Now I'm gonna also uh, update you with the Comet 2020 F8 SWAN. So while I'm talking here, I'm going to be showing you that orbital element. And for us in mid-north latitudes, we are probably looking at May 12th, 13th. It's going to get up above the horizon, but not much, right around 4.30 a.m. And it's going to kind of come up in our northeast and cross over uh, in the east and cross over into the northeast. And I hope the comet stays together, and but we are, it's not going to get very high above the horizon in dark hours. So we're looking at about 4.30 a.m. And that May 13th to the end of the month, I think we'll be able to see it with a good horizon. You'll be able to see it almost all the way to June. So that's hopefully been playing here while I've been talking. And... Uh, but I wanted to say thank you. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for uh, being on the channel. Let me know if you've had experience with internet telescopes or what your reservations might be or what your thoughts are on it down in the dis discussion below. I'll put all the links to the telescope that I accessed, the system I accessed here in the comments below. And uh, yeah, this is, a, this is gonna be a topic of a future video. So thanks again for joining me and thanks for subscribing. And until next time, clear skies.